I, th yeah. I think it's, it's extremely interesting and no doubt questions will arise. I just got one final point to make. I get a, a much less queasy, but a little bit queasy, about um, completely junking the is-ought distinction in the following sense. Um, people think that because I wrote a book called The Selfish Gene, mm. I'm advocating selfishness. And um, so my stock reply to that is, of course, the is-ought distinction. And I presume you would subscribe to that in the sense that um, we do not wish to say that because something is, quote, natural, that oh, because yeah. something yeah. is out there in nature, that therefore that makes it good. And, and obviously you're not advocating that, but that is sometimes what people mean by the is-ought distinction. You're me meaning something much more subtle. Uh, but I just want to throw that in that, that I yeah, wouldn't wish to yeah. throw the, the is-ought distinction out in that sense. Well, it, the, the idea that, that natural could somehow equate to good. Natural that, that, equate to good, yeah, so we all right. want to go around with no clothes on, I mean, that, that, right. that kind of thing. Right. Uh, obviously, there's, there are, are many propensities we have that are, uh, are, we've evolved to have, which we are busily trying to get rid of or overcome and we're wise to. And that's, um, I mean, there's, a, there's I, at some point in the book, I delineate three different projects, which I don't think we should confuse. The first project is to understand how we came to be the way we are, and this is very much your project of just evolutionary science, we had to have an account of how we came to be primates who, who have morally salient uh, emotions like disgust, say. Uh, and that's, that's a story for evolutionary biology and psychology. But there's, a, there's another project, which is we can figure out how we can experience the greatest well-being based on w how conscious states arise in the brain and, and how, the, how they're impacted by uh, the world. And that's a very different project. That, that, breaks, that, that flies free of the perch that has been built for us by evolution. I mean, that's, that's where we can talk about uh, how to raise compassionate children, despite the fact that, and, and how we would, could change the genome to be more compassionate if, if such a thing is possible. The question of whether all of that is possible is very different from, from the question of how we got here. And the third project is just, is just to convince people to drop all of the, the moral commitments that, that lead to unnecessary human misery. And that's a, that's a, that's a political and, and uh, it's a project of persuasion. And that is uh, also distinct. And they often get conflated. I think we should um, open it up for questions. Um, so I was wondering how the moral landscape feeds back on science. And one way it feeds back on science is it makes intelligible <clears throat> the claim that certain truths about the universe may be best left unknown. I mean, it's, 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 quite, it's quite possible that there is intrinsically damaging knowledge given what we are. So, I mean, the, the certain knowledge that human beings, it would, be, it would be rational not to have this knowledge if we could foresee the consequences of having it. And I think we all understand this and agree to it intuitively. I mean, we're not committed to just the maximum dissemination of information. And we're not busily teaching everyone how to synthesize smallpox. You know, it's not, we, we don't want to make, just make sure everyone has these facts in hand. Um, and it's rational not to, to uh, uh, want to spread that around. And I think we could find ourselves in an area of science where, um, the downside of knowing certain facts, or, or certainly knowing how to, to act on certain facts, technologically speaking, uh, if foreseeable, these things are almost never foreseeable, but uh, if foreseeable, or in hindsight, we would say it would be better if we didn't uh, pursue that. This is something that Dan Dennett has spoken about a little bit. Um, that's intelligible to me. Now, you're going to get the people who say, no, 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 I just want to know everything, and my well-being is predicated on knowing everything. Um, and I'm just not going to be happy if we don't know everything. Uh, that, I think, is very likely not an honest claim. Uh, and if you start looking at it, I mean, you just have to keep raising the stakes of the downside for that person to back off that claim, I think. You don't want to know everything if it's going to mean the, 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 uh, the world is going to be plunged into internecine horror for a century. Uh, so I, I hope that dealt with the spirit of your question. First of all, I agree with your framework, and I admire the way that you attempted to build it up. However, I think in order to move forward, in order to make it practical, you need to overcome the classical problem of subjectivity. 
um, which is that, you know, one person's experience is their experience, and how do you then make judgments about that in relation to other people? And I was wondering what your opinion was on what science can say about that with things like functional MRIs revealing more about ourselves. Do you think that, that holds um, an area for progress in being able to make a framework like the one you've outlined practical for moral judgments in the real world? Yeah, well, th this is the, this concern really visits us everywhere in, in the sciences of mind. This, how is it that you can study human subjectivity and make objective claims about first-person facts? There's a lot of confusion around this issue of subjectivity versus objectivity, and because we, we use these words in, in two distinct ways, in, in an epistemological way, which describes how we think of reason about the world, and in an ontological way, in terms of what there just is to be reasoned about. And clearly, we can reason and speak and think ob objectively about subjective facts. And we do this all the time in psychology and neuroscience. We can talk about depression. We can talk about what it's like to be you. Uh, we can talk about you know, whether you feel the pain in your right knee or your left knee. These are, these are subjective facts. These are first-person facts. And yet, you don't have to be self-deceived or illogical or merely led by wishful thinking to talk. I mean, these are not merely, uh, these, are in, these are in the purview of science. Now, it's always a, 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 a tricky experimental question just how much you can take somebody's word for their experience. I mean, we're not incorrigible judges of our experience. We, we can be wrong. We can be self-deceived. We can, we can, you can put me in an experiment where I think I'm, Choosing something based on my uh, uh, you know, previous history of, of liking you know red versus blue, say, but I have been primed unconsciously by the experimenters to choose uh, what I chose, and I have absolutely no subject, subjective insight into it, and yet it is actually we can prove the cause of my my behavior. So people are, can be wrong about their their subjectivity, and and I think we can be wrong about just not, not just the unconscious uh, sources of it, but we can actually be wrong about its character. We can just be bad witnesses to what it's like to be us in, in, the, context, uh, in the context of consciousness. And, and consciousness, therefore, is trainable. We can, we can learn to make discriminations that, that are more refined. It's a gent, but if it's a problem for morality, it is a problem for every scientific study of, of every state of consciousness, psychology and cognitive neuroscience. You mentioned consequentialism. Um, do you think that's a sufficient basis for morality? I do if you, if you revise it the way I, I have attempted to. Um, I think co consequences are what matter. So when you bring forward a traditional retort to consequentialism like deontology, or like you know, Kant's categorical imperative, that, that, that only makes sense as a moral uh, framework if, in fact, its consequences are good. If you, if you have consequences that are, are obviously horrible, it would no longer count as a rule for morality. And so, too, with a Rawlsian analysis of, of uh, justice, say. Now, if, you, if you're going to go with Rawls and say that, that justice, it's not well-being that we care about. It's, it's justice or fairness, say. Well, give me a world that, is, that maximizes justice, but which leads to the needless misery of millions. I mean, if the perfectly just world, the perfectly fair world, immiserates millions who, if you, if you turn the dial of fairness just a little bit, wouldn't suffer in that way, well, then you want to turn that dial. It only, it only, it only counts as, as a moral precept because we recognize, I think, rightly, that fairness and justice are, are, are hugely beneficial. To us, and we all pro we to all tend to profit from a system in which which fairness and justice rank very high in, in our, on our list of moral concerns. But I think the cash value is always the consequences in terms of what I, what I'm calling well-being. And again, well-being is like health; it can keep absorbing the next thing we care about. If you come forward and say, "No, no, you don't understand. There's this other thing that's so important that you are neglecting to to consider," its importance is always going to going to show up in terms of positive changes in, in the conscious states of, of any conscious creature that could experience that thing. Yeah? 
This last hour has been a lot of fun to listen to because we've been engaging in what seems like a very thoughtful, fruitful, intelligent exercise in secular moral reasoning, which is an important thing to do. But I think why we all came here is because you seem to be claiming to do something much, much more interesting than that. Namely, that uh, you could appeal to science to say something that's objectively true about morality, right. rather than simply use science as a way to feed us facts into the normal secular moral reasoning that we'd all like to think we could engage in. Yet when you put down the philosophical cornerstone of your case, you seem to appeal to common sense, sort of low-hanging fruit. Wouldn't everybody say it's objectively wrong or it's really bad, as you put it, when, when you sort of qualify your statement? Wouldn't you say it's bad to throw acid on someone's face? We'd all say it's bad, but that's not the philosophically interesting case that you were uh, proposing to make. So um, it seems like you may be caught between either making a common sense argument on the one hand or an inability to define your position in a strong sense on the other hand. How are you making that really interesting claim that we can turn to science to tell us what's objectively morally true without simply referring to the low-hanging fruit of throwing acid on people's faces and so on? Yeah, a good question. Uh, well, the moment you grant that we're talking about well-being, uh, that we're right to talk about well-being, we can't conceive of, of something else to talk about in this space, uh, then all of the facts that determine well-being become... The, the facts of science, because, because well-being is emerging out of, of the laws of nature in some way. Our conscious states are constrained quite clearly by the laws of nature, whatever they turn out to be. If they entail ectoplasm rising off the brain at death and going to the Christian hell, we're still talking about the way the universe is, and, so, and that would have to fall into, into the purview of some completed science. Now, obviously, there's no reason to believe in any of that. So you could ask a question like, just how important is compassion, say? I mean, what, what is compassion? Is it, what, is, what is the genetic basis for compassion? Is there a, um, what are the practices and uses of attention and institutions that, that, that allow compassion to thrive or, or diminish it? And if there's a trade-off, I mean, just how important is compassion and how, if we have a, a tension between compassion and bureaucratic efficiency, say, what is the right balance there? Now, again, these are all the, the details, the level of brains and the level of lived experience are incredibly complicated. If you get to, to conditions where it's just not at all clear which way to go, you're, you're getting to conditions where figuring out which way to go is, in detail would be incredibly complicated, it, it, much more complicated than economics. And economics is, is still struggling to be a science. But I mean, nobody, so, so clearly we don't understand economic systems with any... Uh, uh, real success at this point. We can keep being blindsided by how they behave, but nobody doubts that there are right and wrong ways to respond to a, a global banking catastrophe, say. And um, I think to, 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 to carve out a space of truth, of real truth, a space where we recognize there are truth claims to be made about good and evil, or truth claims to be made about economics, all we have to acknowledge are the easy cases. I mean, that's why I appeal to the easy cases, because it's like, it's, you know, with economics, we, we, there, uh, economists can disagree about how to respond to uh, uh, a global economic crisis. It's, the, the science is such, and the, and the complexity of the system under analysis is such that we may never be confident about the right answer, but we know there are wrong answers. If, 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 an econ if someone got on CNN and said, well, I've got the solution, let's just destroy all material wealth. Let's just have a huge potlatch where we just burn buildings and ruin everything. Okay, that's, and then we'll have to build it again, and that's a brilliant idea. It's going to put everyone to work. Okay, that's pretty clearly the wrong answer. Now, so we, know, so we know there are better, we know there are right and wrong answers. We know there are ways to fail where your beliefs can be erroneous, and that's that's, um, I'm arguing this is, if it's true for, for something like economics, it's also true for morality.